Hey, how's it going? Hello. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. Sweet, all good. How's it going, Gordon? I'm Jack. Hello, Jack. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, yeah, so today, um, it's just a, really a quick interview about, uh, well, during lockdown, I've started up a small music channel um, interviewing uh, just various people from the industry, really, who I've yes. uh, who I've read a bit about and maybe new bands that I've got an interest in. So, yeah, I'm um, obviously a, a, a fan of the Strokes. And, uh, yeah, I, I read your interview the other day with the NME and I found, right. it, I found it really interesting. So I thought, yeah, try and get you on the channel. Let's do it. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so with everyone so far, I've been going right back to the beginning. Um, early days, I know you grew up in Seattle. Do you, who were like your main musical influences growing up? Uh, main musical influences were the Beatles, Frank Zappa, and Jimi Hendrix and the Doors. Oh, sweet. Okay. All yeah. the, some of the greats there, definitely. And then, yeah. um, and then obviously, uh, you, you were in a, a couple of bands in, in your early days as well uh, in the Seattle scene. Is that correct? Uh, probably in about 30 bands in Seattle. Oh, geez. Yeah, I, I read some. Yeah, I, I, sorry, carry on. Yeah, I just I, uh, I got into playing live in bands when I was about 13. And I just kept joining band after band and sometimes two or three bands at once, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and was it mainly so I, I read you're in a couple of psycho psychedelic bands. Um, was that the main kind of area or was it a whole variety or? No, um, I mean, when I first started, when I was a teenager, you could only play cover tunes. So we did whatever was on the radio, like the Beatles and Neil Young and stuff like that. Yeah. And then um, the, the first real bands I put together were during the new wave and punk era. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was I was involved in a lot of that kind of stuff. But all, yeah. always my music had tons of keyboards because I played keyboards. So I was doing a lot of synthesizer stuff. Nice. And I was in a progress, couple of progressive rock bands and um, some top 40 bands that played at like nightclubs for dances and things, all kinds. Nice. And then um, can I ask you as well? So obviously, um, were you in Seattle around like the, the early 90s when like Nirvana were coming on the scene as well? In, indeed, I was. Yes. Yeah. What, what was kind of the momentum around around that, like the early days of that? Do you remember much or? Well, I remember it very, very well because um, I had been in the music scene before that and it was very small and there were great bands, like brilliant bands all through the different time periods. Mm. But it wasn't until, say, 1989 that Seattle exploded as a concept in the world's imagination. Yeah. And uh, it was like a small fishing village that suddenly became Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, you know that was the feeling. Uh, everything, <laughs> the clubs were exploding. People were out seven days a week. Bands were moving there from all over the United States. Okay. Record labels were running to Seattle to sign band. It was incredible. Oh, sweet, nice. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you kind of moved more into the, the producing kind of area of things. Is that correct? So, um, well, I was always producing. Okay. I, I, I mean, I, before I even learned how to write music, I learned how to record so that I could write. I, mm -hmm. I used the studio as a writing tool. Yeah. Um, later in my life, when I moved to New York, I became a producer for other people as well as just myself. Yeah. And that was a big shift because I never really thought I'd have patience for anyone else's ideas but mine. And yeah. then suddenly it was like a job and it was kind of fun. Yeah. Whereabouts in New York are you based? I lived uh, right next to Tompkins Park in the East Village okay. on 7th Street at Avenue A. And my studio was just uh, five blocks down Avenue A on 2nd Street. Nice. And um, so obviously you um, very famously, you worked, you worked with the Strokes in their early days as well. Um, yes. What do, you, what do you remember of, of them when they first kind of, when you were first introduced to them? Obviously you worked with them on the EP and then the first yes. album and the second as well. But uh, yeah, your early days, your early memories of them. Well, from the moment they came into my studio and we started working together, I learned that I had to take them very seriously and that their ideas were very good and worth listening to 
and I was dealing with some very intelligent guys and they tried very hard. They worked extremely hard and they expected me to work exactly as hard as they did. There was no compromising or almost or second best. It had to be like right or not at all, which was a, wasn't the really the normal rock and roll values I'd grown up with, mm. which was like kind of, oh, that's close enough or yeah, you know, it's, it's possible, you know? Yeah. So. I, I just thought they were very dedicated and very smart right from the very beginning. Nice. And um, that leads me on. So is it true? You, are you bringing out a, a, a book regarding your times around the? Yes, yes, I am. Bring, I, am I wrote a book okay. and I'm looking for a publisher right now. Hmm. Um, I always wanted to write a book, but I never thought I would because I don't like to sit down too much. Yeah. And lockdown, of course, gave me the perfect excuse that, I'm not going anywhere, so I better take advantage of this time to get this book out. Yeah, and yeah, I'm excited for people to read these stories. Yeah, so uh, just for the viewers, it's, so it's um, the concept is is the early noughties. Uh, obviously, it's basically time. how I got from Seattle to New York, mm -hmm. uh, what it was like facing such a big big culture shift once I moved there, and then. I think within uh, two years of moving there or less, I met the Strokes and yeah. that changed my life. And a lot of stories happened because I worked with them on about three and a half records, you know, including the EP. Mm, yeah. Um, do, is there any, um, any, any like small, obviously you don't want to give away too much of your book or anything like that, obviously, but um, is there any small little, uh, nice little funny stories that you could maybe share or? From, oh, uh, from, from your days working with them maybe, maybe sometime uh maybe come like a studio memory possibly uh let's see let's see let's see well i'll just tell you one funny thing from uh room on fire okay uh we were working on room on fire and that was uh at a very big studio i was already living in london by the time room on fire was going on i yeah. lived in london at that time so i went to new york to work on that album and uh one day uh, the guys came in kind of like snickering to themselves and like they, and the Fab said, hey, Gordon, uh, before we start the next song, we need you to get the exact drum sound from Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. Okay. Like, like, what? I mean, that's a multi-million dollar production by some really big Hollywood legend engineers and Quincy Jones producing blah, 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 blah. How in the world am I going to do that? But they really want, they insisted that before we recorded, you know, Fab went out there and played his drums. And it wasn't until I got the exact kick, snare, and hi hat sound of Billy Jean. It took a long time and it was very hard. Yeah. I had to really try everything I could think of to do it. Okay. And then they played the song one time and they said, actually, no, that drum sound's not going to work for this song. <laughs> Jeez. So, Nice. That was a particularly interesting morning. Yeah, that obviously shows again, like like you said before, um, their their refusal to have second best, their, their dedication yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah. And if they have an idea, if they have an idea, they want to pursue the idea until to see if it either works or doesn't work. Mm. You know, and they're very honest with themselves about if they like it or they don't like it. Was there when when you're in New York recording them in the, in the early days? Was there a did you have a feeling that this that their records would explode or be as successful as they were, or was it just kind when of? I, I admit that when I first had them in my studio recording the EP, they were not a band I thought was going to get any attention in the world. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was famous that in those days, guitar music and rock music was out of fashion and yeah. dying quickly in London, in UK, and in new york and in america yeah. like rock and roll clubs were closing down uh hip-hop and pop and electronic music like disco jazz or acid jazz all this stuff drum and bass jungle these yeah. were everybody was talking about this new music mm. and so here these kids walk in with electric guitars and leather jackets and i'm just thinking Oh, it's just too bad, you know, 20 <laughs> years too late, 20 years too late, kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I put the demo, I put their demo on my shelf 
And I just thought it with with a hundred other demos I'd made that, yeah. you know, a couple of years. And uh, I was very surprised when I was wrong. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like everything in life, I suppose there's a lot to do with timing and yeah. I, yeah. And obviously they, they came at just the right time, I suppose. The album came out and, and there, there must have been this kind of, underwave of of people who were just refusing to allow that all them genres of music that you've just said be the forefront of music they still wanted rock and roll and they still wanted the classic so yeah yeah um well it, it, it was a it was a band that what i heard over and over again in the early noughties was kids who hated their older brother's rock and roll and refused to listen to any rock, only electronic music and hip hop. When the mm. strokes came, they saw a way that rock could be considered cool for the first time in their lives. And they kind of started bands and learned how to play the guitar. Yeah. So it was like, it was very interesting. That cultural effect made me quite happy to hear really. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so, so them days, uh... Oh, obviously New, New York and then you moved to Europe or oh, London and, and you spent a bit of time in Berlin as well is that correct? Yes yeah and um, how was it working with uh, Regina Spector as well another huge huge artist? Regina Spector was one of the most talented uh, people I've ever worked with and also one of the most fun records I ever made it was so joyous oh. to listen to those songs coming to life you know, really a revelation for a music fan like me. Yeah, nice. And um, kind of bringing you towards like modern day then. So, so you're set up now in London. Would you, and uh, is this like your, your main home now or have you kind of just been forced to stay here a bit because of COVID or? I live in West Yorkshire. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yes, yes, I moved out into the hill. That's why in the NME article, I'm town mates with the Lounge Society, which got me in the NME recently. Okay. You know, they are musicians that I run into in my local park and in the uh, parking lot of our you know, supermarket here. Mm. So I'm living here. Oh, nice. And of, co of course, when I moved here, I thought I'm gonna be going to take trains to London every couple of weeks for work. And I'm gonna be in Leeds and Manchester and New York and California and all over. Yeah. But I have spent a year uh, in this little village in the north of England. Nice. Well, that's just another, it's an, it's another chapter, isn't it? It's just another fun chapter. Absolutely. A lot. I mean, it has not been completely terrible. I mean, my life has completely changed. I don't even recognize my life anymore. It's <laughs> nothing like I trained for or thought it was going to be this year. Yeah. But being, uh, you know, having my own music to work on and my own creative projects and nowhere to go just means I can focus on, you know, my own things in a different way. Yeah, for sure. And, and so just touching back on, obviously you spent a lot of time this year writing the book. Uh, so are you in the process of trying to gain a, a publishing deal for that or? Definitely looking for publishers. It's not an easy sell, let me yeah. tell you. Uh, a, a nerdy music producer writing his memories of being in the studio and what microphones I was using, yeah. you know, it's just, it, they're not jumping up and down to sign me right now, but I'm going to push it through because I think that there are people who want to read this. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Especially, um, oh, as you said, that it's like 20 years on now as well. So it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's crazy how, how quickly it's gone by. Um, yes. But yeah, so you're working mainly on your own stuff at the minute or you're working with other artists as well? Or? Um, I get a lot of bands sending me tracks to mix. Okay. So that's, that's my little mixing setup behind me. And uh, I really enjoy that because it's something that I can easily do uh, in the lockdown situation. Mm. And I'm still like right now, I'm mixing bands from London, Texas, Brazil, and Portland all oh, okay. this week, this week. So I'm, I'm still feeling connected to the world. Yeah. Um, just to, touching back, sorry, this is all jumbled up. My, my uh, format's a bit all over the place. Um, so going back to like your, your days with the, the Strokes, um, so recording for the, the third album, I know you've done a couple of songs on there. Um, yep. Was that kind of, did they kind of want to, uh, maybe a change in direction slightly or? 
Yes, sure. I think they, I think they wanted a change in direction that they were there was slowly dawning on them over the time they were writing that record. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They wanted they wanted to try something new. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I wonder, oh. yeah. Um that's, that happens with a lot of bands. Obviously, like um I, I know in the early days, Kings of Leon, they 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 uh recorded the first two in Nashville and they were like, if we continue to do this, it's it's very nice to do this, but we want to kind of push the boundaries out and change producer. Otherwise, it just becomes too um like there's there's no problem of trying to evolve and trying to change and learn new things, is there really? Right. Right. Uh, um, it, when, when they wanted when they wanted to move on to the other producer, me because I'm a musician, I wouldn't want to work with a producer or anyone, a drummer that I wasn't really into, that I wanted to try something else. I wouldn't want to be locked into yeah. it. Yeah. So it was easy for me to understand that uh, this was their creative idea. Mm. Um, has there been anyone ever that you've um, that you've been close to working with that it's just kind of not really came around and yes, and, yes, yeah. yes, yes. The most the most uh, impressive example was our band from London, the Liver, the the Libertines. You oh, know? Okay, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was. They'd asked me to produce their first record, and I was really excited because I thought they were fantastic yeah. at that time when I met them. Mm. And uh, it just didn't work out, okay. and I was quite I was quite sad about that, to be honest. Sure, definitely. It's like, yeah, it's like the one that got away. <laughs> yeah, um, it's. I was actually speaking to Gary, the drummer, the other day, actually from uh, the Libertines. I love um, Gary. Awesome, yeah, great guy. Um, and finally, um, if there was anyone for from the past at all any band that could be alive or dead now that you would have loved to have worked with um yes. who would it have, who would it have been definitely Jimi hendrix okay yeah yeah i would like to be there when he was doing that to see how he does it <laughs> Just, yeah formidable yeah amazing yeah. yeah brilliant well um i really appreciate your time today i know it's been probably a bit hard like getting hold of you and stuff like that and you're a busy guy mixing and producing but um, yeah, I just thought it was really beneficial. Well, really great to get you on the channel. And um, yeah, I really hope everything goes well with the book. And Thank you. For future projects as well. But uh, yeah, I'll be sharing, I'll be sharing this to, to the, the small number of followers that I have on the channel. And All right. Well, thanks for having me. Perfect. You have a good rest of your day now. Ciao. Cheers. Bye.